Hi friends, welcome back. It's me, your boy, Scott Tidwell, and I wanna talk nerdy to you. Today, I wanna to pick up where we left off, talking about my favorite Dungeons & Dragons campaign setting, Dark Sun. If you like what I've got to say, give me a like, hit that subscribe button, let me know in the comments below what you loved, what you thought was okay, and what you want me to talk about next. Okay, let's get into it. You may remember from our last video, we talked about the post-apocalyptic themes and dying earth themes in the Dark Sun campaign setting. Just a quick recap, in the ancient past of Dark Sun, there was an arcane apocalypse, a great cataclysm that destroyed most of the plant life in the world, transformed the sun into a red giant, turning the planet into a barren desert. After the world was nearly destroyed, the civilization that was left began a long and slow slide into decay and decadence. Scarcity is the order of the day. Water, metal, food, all of these things are an extremely short supply. Survival is often people's number one priority. So I think those are some of the themes that make Dark Sun famous, but there's a lot more to the setting that makes it really cool. And today I wanna to talk about another set of themes that distinguish it from other fantasy campaign settings. Now we're all familiar with the themes of medieval Western European fantasy campaign settings. You've got kings and knights and princesses in distress and dragons and the whole feudal order and castles. Dungeons and Dragons was originally intended to be set in such a setting and a lot of fantasy settings use these themes today. Of course, there are definitely exceptions. I'm looking at you, Legend of the Five Rings and Talus Lancia, just to name a couple that come to mind that break these tropes. Dark Sun does it in a very interesting way, a different way from those other games. Dark Sun takes a lot of inspiration from the ancient world, the Bronze Age and the early Iron Age. So we're talking ancient Rome, ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, and even my personal favorite, ancient Mesopotamia. So the topic of the video today is the way that these ancient themes enter into Dark Sun and the way that we can think of Dark Sun as an ancient campaign setting. One of the first things people notice about Dark Sun is that it's a primarily urban campaign setting. So in the medieval Western European setting, right, population density is very low, everybody's spread out, it's very rural, there are towns, there are farms, I mean, there are castles. In the traditional setting of that type, there aren't a lot of big cities because that's how Western Europe was at the time. There weren't a lot of big cities. There were just farms and towns and manors. Dark Sun is very different from that. In Dark Sun, there are seven great city-states where the vast majority of the human population lives. In Dark Sun, it's not possible for the population to be primarily rural and spread out like that. The entire world is a desert. It's extremely difficult to survive. Instead, in the original campaign box set, there are seven great city-states. Each one of them is situated on one of the few remaining oases left in the world, a sort of dwindling, fertile patch where there's some water, there's some greenery. Outside the city is a vast desert wasteland. Most of the people that live there are either escaped slaves, hunter-gatherers like the insectoid Thrycreme, or herders, nomads, and merchants that wander from city to city to trade. One of the most well-known of the seven city-states is the city of Tyr. A lot of Dark Sun campaigns start in the city of Tyr. Uh, the novels, the Prism Pentad, most of them took place in the city of Tyr, and the main protagonists of those novels are all characters who were born and raised in the city of Tyr. Now, compared to cities today, and even cities in the ancient world, Tyr is pretty small. The books indicate that there are maybe 15,000 people living in the city of Tyr. The books also say, sort of shockingly, that the slave population of Tyr outnumbers the free population two to one. That means there are 10,000 slaves in the city of Tyr and only 5,000 free people. Sounds like a messed up place. And trust me, it gets worse. So the city is situated in a moderately fertile valley located in the foothills of the Great Ringy Mountains. There's not a lot of freestanding water in the valley, but there is water beneath the ground. Slaves toil all day and all night turning giant wooden screws to crank water up from out of the wells to irrigate the fields and provide drinking water for the people. I hope you're getting the impression that this is a dark and messed up place. Now the ruler of Tyr is one of my favorite villains in the Dark Sun campaign setting, King Kallik, the King of Tyr, also known as the Tyrant of Tyr, which is actually the title he prefers, 
What does that say about him? Now, there are a lot of rumors swirling about King Kallak. People say that he's ruled the city of Tyr for over a thousand years. People say he's immortal. People say that he's one of the greatest sorcerers to live on the planet. One great thing about King Kallak is that he doesn't mess around about his right to rule. He doesn't claim to rule by divine right because some god gave him the right. He doesn't claim to be a god himself like some of the other sorcerer kings do. No, Kallak is very upfront about the fact that he rules Tyr because he is the most powerful sorcerer in Tyr, and anyone that challenges his rule will be crushed. Now, even the most powerful sorcerer can't maintain order in a city of 15,000 people, 10,000 of whom are in bondage. Kallak relies on his minions, and oh, what minions they are. Another of my favorite elements of the Dark Sun campaign setting is the servants of the Sorcerer Kings, the Templars. You should think of the Dark Sun Templars as priest bureaucrats. They worship the Sorcerer Kings, and the Sorcerer Kings somehow grant the Templar spells in exchange for their service. In the original Dark Sun campaign setting, the Templar class was basically a cleric. It was, a, it was its own class. It was a little different from the cleric class, but that's basically what it was. A Templar could cast the same spells that a cleric could cast. I think they could turn undead, if I remember right. They could wear armor and they could fight. They were basically kind of like a cleric, a sort of corrupt and evil cleric that worshiped the Sorcerer Kings. They're also bureaucrats. They are the judges, the administrators, and the rulers of the city-states. The Templars have a monopoly on reading and writing. One of the most heinous crimes that a citizen of Tyr can commit is learning how to read and write. Because look, we all know knowledge is power, and the Templars jealously guard that power for themselves and a few select nobles who are allowed to read and write as well. So no one can administer the law because no one can really know what the law is because they can't read it. No one can administer trade because they can't keep accounts and keep records and write contracts. Only the Templars can do these things. You can imagine how powerful they are in a city like this. On top of that, the Templars have a monopoly on the use of legal magic. We talked last time about what wizards do to the environment when they cast spells, so you can imagine that most people hate them, and the Sorcerer Kings want to keep other wizards out of their city because those wizards might, you know, kill the plant life that the Sorcerer Kings need to cast their spells. Of course, there are other spellcasters, clerics and druids, and I remember reading somewhere that technically casting divine magic like that is also illegal, but the Templars usually overlook it because the common people rely on clerics and druids for healings and divinations and things like that. So as long as the clerics and the druids kind of keep a low profile and don't challenge the Sorcerer King, the Templars basically leave them alone. The other thing to note about the Templars is that they are extremely evil and corrupt, just like the Sorcerer Kings themselves. One of their main activities is seeking bribes from everybody they see and they meet. Oh, do you want a permit to open a shop in the City of Tyr? That's gonna be a bribe. Oh, did you look at a Templar the wrong way? Okay, well, you're gonna be sold into slavery unless there's a bribe. These people are awful. They're some of the worst villains in D&D. I remember in the original box set, the Templar class had this very cool sort of judgment legal power where they could accuse people of crimes, they could sell people into slavery, they could have people thrown in jail, all of these sorts of things. And who you could accuse and who you could throw in jail depended on your level. So they had to be lower level than you. I think if they were a noble or an aristocrat, they had to be like way lower level than you. So Templar PCs had a lot of power in the city state and could just go around messing with people. Let's talk about real world antecedents and inspirations for this social structure found in Dark Sun. To my mind, this is a lot like what some historians have called a hydraulic despotism. Hydraulic as in water. I'm not a historian, and I'm not sure if historians today still think this idea of a hydraulic despotism is a good one or not. But the idea is out there, and I think Dark Sun is clearly inspired by it. So the hydraulic despotisms were ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia. Now, one of the key features of these societies is that they had these all-powerful absolute monarchs. So you had the pharaohs in Egypt, and then Mesopotamia, they had their various kings. The Persians eventually had the shahs, the emperors. The idea behind hydraulic despotism is that these rulers gained their absolute power because organization and management was necessary to manage water resources in the ancient Middle East. So think about Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia for a second. 
Their agriculture was based entirely on irrigation with river water. So you had the Nile in ancient Egypt and you had the Tigris and Euphrates in ancient Mesopotamia. There's not really a lot of rain in these areas. So if you want water to irrigate your crops, you've got to get it from the rivers. And if you want to have a farm any distance away from the river, you've got to have canals to carry your irrigation water to your farm. Another issue is that these rivers flood. The Nile floods famously every year, but the Tigris and Euphrates, they flood too. And if you're not careful and you've got a farm too close to the river or you've got a city too close to the river, it's gonna flood and it's gonna cause a lot of damage. So the ancient Mesopotamians and the ancient Egyptians dug a lot of irrigation ditches and irrigation canals, both to take water out to the farms and to control the flooding when it came. And these irrigation systems were very labor intensive and they were very big. It took a lot of people to coordinate and work together to build these things and maintain them. So the hydraulic despotism theory goes, the very first absolute kings, absolute monarchs and bureaucracies arose from the necessity to manage these irrigation projects, to manage the city's water resources. And because they were so vital to everybody's survival, the people of these cities were willing to give a great deal of power to the kings and the bureaucrats that managed these water projects. It ends up, interestingly enough, especially in Mesopotamia, but I think in Egypt as well, that the bureaucrats and the administrators and managers that managed all of these things were actually priests. So it ends up that the center of these ancient economies was the temple. Farmers would grow their stuff, the priests would manage and oversee and administer everything. The farmers would bring their produce to the temples where they would deposit it with the priests. The priests would keep records, they would keep contracts. They would exchange small clay tokens for the produce that farmers deposited. And then the priests would redistribute all of this produce to the artists, to the other priests, to the aristocrats and everybody else in the city. It's a sort of strange way to operate an economy, it seems to me, but all the evidence points to this being how it was in the ancient Near East. So I think you can see the connection to Dark Sun, right? You've got these great city-states that are situated on some of the only remaining water resources in the world. There are these absolute monarchs that rule them absolutely through the offices of their priest bureaucrats that manage the whole situation. Now, there are some variations on this hydraulic despotism idea in Dark Sun. Let me mention just a couple of my favorites, or maybe just the ones that stand out to me because they are kind of a shout out to ancient Greece and Rome. So the city of Tyr, classic hydraulic despotism, actually has a Senate, kind of like the Senate of Rome. Many of the most ancient and powerful noble families in the city have a hereditary seat in the Senate. The Senate in Tyr is completely powerless. It can discuss and it can talk, but it cannot pass any laws and it cannot do anything practical. It's said that anytime the senators try to do anything practical or speak out against the king, the Templars have them assassinated. Now that's a little bit like the Senate in Rome operated after the fall of the Republic and the creation of the empire. The Caesars allowed the Senate to continue debating and doing its thing, but the Senate had no power and sometimes the Caesars would assassinate senators that got, let's say, uppity. Another variation on the hydraulic despotism idea comes from the city-state of Balak. The government of Balak harkens back to ancient Greece. I think specifically ancient Athens, because it's bizarrely in Dark Sun, kind of a democracy. Every citizen of Balak is a soldier. And at times of war, the citizens can all be called up to join the army and fight to defend the city. The other sorcerer kings, of course, have slave armies, not citizen armies. Also, everyone with any power in Balak is technically elected. Even the sorcerer king, Andropinus, was elected dictator for life. Of course, he was elected dictator for life 2,000 years ago. I don't think anyone at the time realized that he was immortal. Too bad they didn't know that. They may have cast a different vote. Also, all of Balak Alex Templars have to run for office. Of course, if Andropinus wants a particular Templar to get elected to a particular office, any Templars that run against his favorite candidate are sometimes assassinated. But those are a couple of the most interesting variations on the hydraulic despotism idea in Dark Sun. Okay, friends, that's the end of this video. We talked about the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. We talked about how a lot of themes in Dark Sun kind of harken back to the ancient world. That's one of the cool things that sets it apart from other D&D campaign settings. Like I said, if you like the video, please give me a like. If you don't like the video, please give me a like anyways. Hit that subscribe button. Tell me what you want me to talk about next. Tell me what you like about Dark Sun. Tell me about the crazy things that have happened in your Dark Sun campaigns. And I'll look forward to seeing you guys again.